So if you're visiting with us, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to Madison. Uh, we've been studying verses uh, about getting strength. And so this will be our last class. It's, uh, it's kind of hard to imagine this being the last class. Uh, it goes by so quick. But I, I want to thank uh, Aaron and Jonathan and Cam and Jason. I think we've really enjoyed teaching this, this quarter. Uh, I encourage you next quarter in this room, uh, you'll have Danny uh, and Zach and Spencer teaching uh, this whole idea of being happy. So they're going to go through the Beatitudes and quite a few verses that, that talk about just being happy. So I know that's going to be a great, a great class. So this is our last week. And so probably if on the very first class, if I said write down a verse that talks about being strengthened, this is probably the verse everybody would write down, right? Because this is the verse, uh, Philippians 4.13, that we all, we all know, right? Where Paul says, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Just a little bit about the book of uh, Philippians, right? It's written, Paul was writing to the church at Philippi. Uh, it's a very informal letter. A lot of Paul's letters... Like if you go to Romans, it's very formal. But Philippians is very informal. Uh, he was probably writing from prison. The one thing about the city that a lot of people don't know is that there was a, a large number of exiled and retired Roman soldiers. And so it was often referred to as Little Rome because there was such a population of former soldiers that was very much uh, like being in the city of Rome. So tonight... We're going to look at, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. But as when we typically study, right, you really have to look at the context of the verse, which means you need to look at the verses in front of it or the verses after. So we're actually going to go up to uh, verse 11 and start our study. So if you want to, you can go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4, uh, beginning with verse 11. Here Paul writes, I don't say this out of need, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through Him who strengthens me. All right, so you guys... Back when we talked about prayer, I mentioned that when we study, right, when we do our Bible study, or we look at a set of verses, that the first pass you go through is to write observations. Write out things that stand out. Write out words that are repeated, right? And that's what we kind of start when we do an interpretation of a certain, or in this case, verses. So what you'll notice, or what stood out to me as we read through this, is we see this, we see this word learn mentioned twice. We see content mentioned twice, and we see all mentioned twice. So as we look at these verses, there are three things that stand out that we're going to talk about tonight uh, that Paul writes, and they are learn, content, and all. Those are the words that you see repeated multiple times in those three short verses. So let's talk about learn. So once again, Paul says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things uh, through him who gives me strength. So let's talk a little bit about this whole word, learn. Reading or going back to what Paul says, what's an implication? What's something that you can immediately kind of pull from that? Uh, what's the implication here that, that Paul makes? The implication is there was some point where Paul wasn't content, right? Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, I feel like now in my life, I'm fairly patient, right? Uh, but if you were to look at the 20-something me, 
not patient at all, right? So it's learned. So the whole idea was it wasn't always like this for Paul, right? It wasn't always where Paul uh, had that. He grew, right? He, he learned or developed this process. And it's probably something that didn't come easy. Uh, and it didn't really come quickly. So what, what does this teach us? How does this make you feel when you read this about Paul? Yeah, doesn't it give you a little hope in a way? Because, you know, we, we look at the apostles. I mean, we always talk about Peter and Peter kind of being, in, you know, you know, in, uh, in, you know just kind of like jumping or, or open his mouth. But when you think of Paul, right, you think of all the things he went through uh, uh, for the gospel. You think of all those things. You, you feel like you can't really measure up to Paul, right? But here we see that this is something that Paul had to learn. Therefore, it is something that we can learn. Uh, we can learn as well. So, here's a big question: How do you learn? Let, well, let's talk first about the non-scriptural things. Let's just talk about math or or whatever. How do you, you know? You guys uh, talked about being in physics class, and I mentioned that I was never in physics class. <laughs> so, how, how do you learn? How, I mean, how do we learn? What's, what are some of the ways that we learn? Biggest thing is repetition, right? For me with math, right? It was making worksheets and just doing the problems over and over and over again through repetition. So one way, right, I think that we find ourselves learning is uh, through this repetition, seeing God's promises, uh, seeing that He will strengthen us in whatever situation we're in, that's how we'll learn. What are some other ways that we learn? Well, there has to be someone to share the initial knowledge. It's not like you just go, oh, math, I'm going to do this repeatedly and I'm going to figure it out. Someone has to show you how or teach you in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Someone else has to have the knowledge to share with you. So where do we get that knowledge? From Paul, From Paul exactly, right? <laughs> you, you guys have probably heard me say it before. I think the reason why we're often very unsuccessful when we study the Bible is we're, we approach it in the wrong way. We approach studying the Bible to know. We should approach the Bible in order to grow, right? We can have all the knowledge in the world about the Bible, but if we hadn't applied it and made application to our life where we grow spiritually and maturity, then it's just a bunch of trivia that we have in our, in our head. And so as we, I mean, the first step of learning, right, is to start reading and start studying the Bible. And no, nothing bad about reading plans. I do a reading plan every year. But that can't be the only time you spend in the Bible is just reading 20 verses a day or whatever, right? It, it involves study, right? You guys been through college. Some of you all still in college. You, you know how many hours you have to put in to a class to make a good grade. And it's kind of the same approach here as well. Any other comments on how we, how we learn? That's a great one, isn't it? Is that uh, we learn through our mistakes. So you, or someone else's mistakes. What's the thing about, what's the thing about mistakes? Yeah, I mean, if we don't do, if we don't ever do anything, right? At least you try. You try and, and you learn through those mistakes. Now, in some cases, right, the, your, your lesson from that mistake might not come until well after it happened, right? Might not be initially obvious. A couple of things that uh, I shared or I thought about as well uh, from the scriptures, right? is if we go into Philippians chapter 4, back up a little more to verse 8 through 9, Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I think one way that we learn is we really have to learn 
to savor the blessings, right? We, we don't dwell, right? We don't think about all the good things that God has given you and blessed you with in your life, right? Dwell on those things. Spend time thinking about those things, right? Uh, make a list. What's the good things about your family? What's the good things about your friends? What's the good thing about your spouse? What's the good thing about Madison, right? Spend time dwelling and focusing on the positive. Focus on uh, those good things, right? And when, when you may feel like you want to complain about something, go back and savor those, savor those blessings, right? Because I think that's how you learn to be content, right? If you spend so much time on the negative, then you're never going to wind up being happy with what you have. So I think one thing that Paul tells us in, in verses 8 and 9 is to really savor those blessings, right? Uh, the other thing is, we go to Philippians 4.13, which we talked about. I think sometimes... Uh, I think sometimes we get caught up in this worldly view of wanting more. When I think one of the things that Paul tells us is Christ is sufficient, right? It, it's sufficient for, uh, for all our needs. Uh, and I think one of the things that we're going to talk about with Paul, since he has learned that Christ is sufficient, all these things in life is just, is just the extra. Right? Uh, it might wind up being the icing on the cake. It, it may wind up being the, the tough things. But he's learned that Christ uh, is sufficient. And then the last thing about learning is we got to realize that Christ is supreme, right? Uh, Philippians 1.21 says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So what I've got out of here. What I've got, what I got bold here, imagine that was not there and there was just a fill in the blank for you, right? H how would you fill in the blank, right? Uh, for me to work, right? I know some of us love our job, so we might put, you know, for me to work, but what happens to work when you're gone? It just keeps going, right? Uh, for me to live is college football. Love college football, right? But fill in the blank. Take time to fill up, fill in the blank and look and see what is really the purpose in your life, right? Love family. Family brings a ton of joy, but you just can't live for family, right? It's got to be Christ because Anything you put in this blank except Christ, where this says to die is gain, anything you put in there besides Christ, to die is, it's loss, right? It's just all loss. And so these, is, you know, these are, besides the things we mentioned earlier, these were three things that I thought, this is going to be good for us to help us understand that contentment can be learned, right? It's a learned behavior. Uh, comes with growing and experiencing. Back in verse 9, something that really just now struck me was where it says, learned and received. You, as you can know something and not really internalize it or, in my mind, receive it. it. We have to really work at letting God mold us into something different, which is kind of the learning process. Paul didn't start out knowing how to be content. He he received that information and he changed based on it. We have to keep ourselves open to yep. and making that change. You know, sometimes sometimes we can know the stories. Like when we talk about the Bible, sometimes we can know the stories, but that doesn't necessarily mean we know the story, right? And so I think that's one of the things that we, we strive to try to do. All right. Any other comments about learning? All right. So that next one was this whole idea of being content. So 
what does what does contentment, right? What does contentment mean to you? That word. Satisfy. What what are what's a word or words that sometimes we think mean the same thing? Happy, right? Paul, I don't think Paul's saying is I've learned to be happy in everything, right? And I think we've got to realize there's a difference between happiness and contentment, right? Uh, so I love cars, right? And so I have a, a, a I love Jeeps, I had like eight Jeeps. And so right now I have a 05, 2005 Jeep that's in the shop. Been in the shop for like two weeks and it's like the CPU is out, right? So today, uh, wasn't happy, right? But I'm content. Everything's going to work out, right? And so I think one of the things, and I know Danny and company is going to do a great job next quarter, is, you know, where, is, ha where does happiness come from? And so when we think about, you know, when we think about contentment, we got to realize it's not happiness. Oftentimes, happiness is based upon the situation you're in right now. And contentment's a much bigger picture. Do you think this whole idea of contentment or of being content is something that comes uh, naturally to us? It didn't evolve. We learned, so why should it be any different for us? Yeah. Well, I think we... Yeah. You know, I, I think we we have to be very careful not to necessarily fall into the woe is me, right? We have to realize that uh, it, it, is, it is something that's difficult. It is something that's not our nature. And, and, and what does that remind you of that we've kind of been studying on Sundays? It's that whole idea of transformation, right? I got to be transformed from thinking like the world and be transformed into thinking more like Christ, right? Which is less of me. And so content is something that is uh, uh, quite different, right? Uh, so I like this, and I don't remember what, uh, uh, I can't remember what version. I think I've told you before I like reading different versions, but it translates this way where Paul said, Whatever the circumstances in any and every situation, I can be self-sufficient. I can be resilient. I can be unbreakable and undefeated and victorious in my attitude. I can make the most of things under the harshest of conditions through him who enables me to do that. He infuses me with strength for this very thing. He strengthens my ability to remain resolute and positive whatever happens. And I know that is quite the, the translation, right, the, uh, than what we normally see. But the couple things I like is Paul is saying it's the attitude I approach things, that is in my control. And Christ can help me have the proper attitude, right? And so I think that's one of the things when I read that content that I find... Uh, quite helpful, right? And I always, I don't know about you parents, but you know, I, I would always, you know, uh, either Alyssa or Cole would come home from school and they'd bring a note home and they were like, we know that person just made me so mad. And I would always sit down and said, you know, no one can make you mad. It's your attitude, your decision of whether or not you get angry. And I, and I think that's what Paul, one of the things Paul's pointing out here is it's really our attitude that we can control. All right, so now we're going to do all. Uh, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. This is the verse we're all familiar with in Romans 8.28. Uh, look at Isaiah. We see this little bitty word show up a lot. Isaiah 38.17, For you have cast all my sins behind your back. Uh, Matthew 10.30, But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Uh, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow, follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and all these things will be added unto you. So we see this word all. And I got a lot of all, didn't I? All right. So I am married to an English teacher. For someone from West Tennessee, the hardest thing that we've had to do in our marriage, right, is for me to, to, to use one syllable for, wor- for red and one syllable for head, right? I feel like that uh, movie where they teach the, the lady proper English, right? So living with an English teacher, very difficult. She would say, she would say all of this, that this all grammatically is unnecessary, right? Uh, because First Peter, ca- you know, casting your anxieties on him because he cares for you, that that all grammatically, it's not, not necessary. But what does that all mean to you? Yeah. Your, insec- your anxieties, right? I got the small anxiety of, you know, finding a CPU for a 2005 Wrangler. Then I got the big anxiety about retirement, right? Doesn't matter whether it's big or small, the whole idea of that all is it includes everything. If we go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter descri- describes God as being the God of all grace. Well, he could have just said the God of grace, right? But instead, the all puts that picture in our minds that there's no sin too small, no sin too big, that His grace isn't going to cover. And so we see this word all in here, and it magnifies the verse, right? It it means there's nothing too small for God to care about, and there's nothing too large, okay? And so grammatically might not be uh, required, but for me, spiritually, and learning to, and doing that learn to be content, it's a great word, right? It's a fantastic word. And so we see that word uh, all. Uh, oh, I skipped a question. Um, but I think it's important that we, that we take a look at that. So let's keep talking about all, because I think this is the other thing that we see, is this word all is sometimes qualified by the passage, right? So going back to the verse in 1 Peter, where Peter says, it's the God of all grace, right? Meaning that that grace covers a multitude multitude of things. But when Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, if that all is qualified what do you think or how do you think Paul is using that term here? Does it, it, do you think he's talking about I can really do all things? Like I can go part the Red Sea like Moses. I have all power, right? How, how do you think he winds up? Uh, uh, what do you think he winds up applying that word all here? All the things that happen to himself. Yeah, himself. yeah exactly. The all the beatings, the being in prison, not you know, being hungry, being poor, you know, being need, you know, not being in need, all those things that he's gone through, right? He can go through all those things because Christ strengthens him. I think it's very important for us to remember because sometimes some folks will misinterpret that verse to say that he has the power to do all things, right? Uh, like we, you know, I mentioned Moses part in the Red Sea, right? Paul's not simply, Paul's not saying I have the power to do anything I desire to do, right? He's really talking about that he can do all those things he's gone through. He can maintain that positive attitude because of Christ uh, who strengthens me, right? And this is uh, uh this is another, I think this is actually the, maybe the New Living Translation. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through Him who gives me strength, right? And I think that's what we need to realize is 
I know we're going to go through tough times. Some of you are probably going through tough times right now, right? Uh, you may have family members who are sick. You may have lost I mean, your job. Every, all of us are going through difficult times. And everybody's different uh, as far as what, what things they're going through. But I think what Paul is wanting to get us to learn or get across is no matter what you're going through, right, God will give you strength and he'll help you through that. And that's part of that learning process, part of that uh, maturity uh, process, right? His, we talked last week about strengthening that inner being, right? So Paul's inner being is being strengthened, allowing him to rejoice, right? We may think rejoicing is kind of, but it allows him to rejoice and be content in whatever situation he finds himself in, right? Now, is learning, is learning, we talked about that it's sometimes difficult. Sometimes it's a long process. Is it a painful process? Yeah. Let me tell you, me and math four in high school, that was a painful, that was a painful process. Uh, I had a, uh, so I had an older sister who, who was four years older, who from, from junior high on, top 10, probably top in the top five. Her name was Marcia. I would go to class and they would say, are you Marcia's little brother? And I'd go, Marcia, 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 right? <laughs> and she, excellent grades. I would always have that disclaimer to the teacher, well, don't expect, don't expect that quality of work, right? <laughs> and, and my dad made sure when those report cards came home that learning sometimes was a little more painful than other times. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think, you know, it's those mistakes. It's those things that we go through that are painful, but that's a part of that learning that learning process as well, right? You know, I mean, look at our, look at toddlers, right? We always want to, you know, kid proof the house or toddle proof the house, but sometimes something's going to happen, right? They're going to touch something that's too hot or too sharp. And it, that's just kind of part of that learning, that learning process. And I think that's a, a great analogy for the last point, right? Is it's all about perception, right? If we dribble, if we dribble with our head down, you know, we, I, I mentioned last week uh, that I uh, got certified in diving in high school. And so one of the things that we had to do was they turned the lights off. It was an indoor pool. They turned the lights off. We would have to swim diagonally. Uh, from one corner to the other using a compass, right? And so you would look at your compass and you'd put your hand out this way so that when you got to the other wall, right, you're, you'd feel it. Well, you get so nervous, you kind of want to hold that still, and so your perception is focused solely on that compass. And so what happened to me was the first thing that hit that wall was the top of my head, right? And so... I think what Paul's saying and what Jason said is that Jesus strengthens our perception. We try to look beyond that narrow vision and we look at the big and we look at the big picture. And if we keep the big picture in mind, right, it's a lot easier to be content because we kind of see this little bump in the road 
It's, it's just temporary. Uh, and he's able to maintain, and Jason alluded to this, right? Paul was able to maintain a healthy attitude even while he was in prison, right? And the Roman prison wasn't, you know, the country club, right? It was, it was pretty difficult. All right. Good. I got through that because I've uh, got a couple of final thoughts for the bell rings. We're going to go to another verse about strength. Uh, and this is in Psalms 84, uh, verses 5 through 7, if you want to turn there. So, uh, Psalms 84, beginning with verse, verse 5. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. So I know Aaron and Cam and Jonathan and Jason and I, we've done this very subtly. Maybe we should have like really put it on the title slide each time. But this verse signifies what we've been trying to get across, right? So in this verse, the psalmist talks about the journey that a good Jew would make from wherever they live to Jerusalem, right? Uh, they talk about the highway they're on. And so for me, one of the things we've tried to get across is life is that journey, okay? So the psalmist talks about that they got to travel through the Valley of Baca, which at certain times of year was pretty much impassable. It was difficult. It was a difficult journey. Uh, if you know about Jerusalem, Jerusalem sets well over a mile above the surrounding, and so the road up to Jerusalem is very difficult. And so what the psalmist is saying is to go from wherever you are to Zion or to Jerusalem. It's a it's a tough journey, and so what happens is the traveler goes from strength to strength. Right? They'll go up the hill, and they'll struggle. But then when they go down the hill, it's a little easier. They'll go through the desert only to come to an oasis. So part of that journey that they make, it, it goes from spot to spot. And that is probably what we wanted to make sure we covered in this class, is life's a journey. And the only way to get from the beginning to the end is to live it from strength to strength. When you... God strengthens you when you're, in, when you're in joy and He strengthens you when you're in pain. And so we've got to learn to live from strength to strength. Uh, we go keep going a little bit farther in Psalms 84 and verse 10. And I think this is what sums all that up, right? For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does He withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in You. Right? And so we read this in Psalms, and, and what we want to get across is that, number one, you can't make it through life without strength. That strength comes from God. The strength comes from church, right? The strength comes from your brothers and sisters, right? And so life is just a series of challenges that we go through, but we go through it with strength by strength, right? That's how we make it. And so I kind of want to review just a little bit what we've talked about in this quarter, right? So if we look, right, we started off uh, Jason started us off with this whole idea uh, that your strength will equal your days, right? Start off with this whole idea that throughout your life, God will never stop uh, strengthening you. And probably my favorite, right, is Second Chronicles 16.9. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to Him. Nehemiah 8.10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Psalms 46.1, God is our refuge and strength. Isaiah 30.15, in quietness and trust 
is your strength. Isaiah, those who hope in the Lord will, re will renew their strength. The Lord will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Love the Lord, your God, with all your strength. Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. And then I can do all things who gives me strength. Right? Those are all the verses that we covered. And if you want to do a great word study, do all the verses that talk about strength. Because we've just touched on just a few in the 12 weeks of the class. But the whole point was that no matter what you're going through, if right now you're in one of those top of the mountain, God's with you and he'll give you strength. If you're in a valley, if you're going through the desert, if, in your, if you're in a tough spot, depend on God. because He will provide you strength. Our life is a series of going from strength to strength. And, it's, and when we fail is when I talked about that God searches through, ser God searches the world looking to strengthen those who are committed to Him. And what gets us in trouble is when sometimes we lose a little bit of that commitment, right? And so these are the verses that we hope will give you encouragement. Uh, we hope that you found useful. Uh, we hope that you uh, got something or learned something from the class about this whole idea of strength. Uh, Co-teacher, anything to anything you 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 would like to to add or uh, anything? Well, I think thank you. Um, I think this is probably the first time I've actually finished early in a class. Any any comments uh, before we just we break and and visit? Before we close our prayer, any comments or questions? Or uh, let's close with a prayer, and then we'll go ahead and be dismissed early. Our heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time we have to study your word. Father, we know that your word is a lamp into our feet, and it guides our path. Father, we're we're thankful for uh, the fact that you strengthen us, that you strengthen us in the time we need it. Father, we ask that we take your word, we take your message, and we learn. We learn to be content. We learn to be joyful. We learn to, to share that good news with others. Father, we ask that you be with those within our family uh, and within our family who right now who are struggling, maybe due to sickness or, or the circumstances they're in. Father, we know that you can provide them strength, but let us also help uh, provide them strength as well. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.